Good morning, church. Welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. What better way to fill the extra hour than we've been given than to fill it with some Bach um, and uh, to hear that beautiful music. Um, some of us actually experienced the organ of the church where Bach worked for 20 years. So welcome again. If you're here in the meeting house, if you're joining us online, we're glad you're here. Uh, if you might be here for the first time and you're present with us in the Meeting House, a special welcome to you. Our hope uh, is that you might experience the hospitality of this community of faith. Um, also, we would invite you to fill out the little card in that rack in front of you called a Connect card. Fill that out, put it in the plate as it comes by so we can stay in touch with you. As uh, most of us already know, the Connect card is for making known prayer requests also, and those are offered by our prayer team around the piano after worship. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of stuff in the announcements uh, today in your bulletin, so please do read that thoroughly. Uh, as, as I said, there is a lot going on, but I want to highlight a few things uh, and commend them to your further reading. First of all, today is the first Sunday of the month, so birthday endowment, so, sort of the equivalent of putting a few coins in our piggy bank. If this is your birthday or somebody in your life you want to celebrate, uh, the idea is to give a gift to the church that corresponds to the number of years uh, you're celebrating. Uh, and you can get those donations to us through the office or you can donate online. Um, speaking of Bach, we have another great musician that we're celebrating, actually two of them. We're going to have Mozart Sunday next week. Uh, with Dennis Schrock, who will be our guest conductor. Dennis is kind of a sort of rock star in the world of choral music, and so it, it will be a special treat to have him and have the, uh, some special music from the choir. So please invite a friend uh, to be with us next Sunday as we also enjoy and worship with the music of Mozart. And speaking of choral singing, Messiah, if you're into uh, singing uh, at all, you're welcome to a Messiah sing. On Wednesday evening, December 6th, read more about that in the bulletin. Um, thank you so much, all those who helped with the flea market. It, I'm pleased to announce that we have raised over $7,000 through our flea market. So, yes, let's give them a hand. All that goes toward mission. Uh, and thank you, Andrea and Nancy and your whole team. Um, great job. We kicked off a men's Bible study. We had a planning session for a Bible study, a men's Bible study that we're kicking off. And the next session is going to be uh, December, actually I think it's the third. Um, uh, and so we hope that you might be interested in joining us. You'll be hearing more about that uh, as the weeks go by. Um, <clears throat> Gala, so there's still some tickets left, but please know that next Sunday is the last day that you're gonna be able to buy tickets. We need to get the number to the caterer uh, you don't, you don't want to have FOMO here, okay? Uh, for those of you who may not know the acronym, is fear of missing out. You don't want to miss uh, a great time at the gala on November, uh, November the 18th. Um, also, be aware that the task special offering will be two weeks from today on the 19th uh, as we remember uh, to uh, those who might be experiencing hunger at this time of year. Uh, finally, I want to welcome our very special guest and uh, our guest preacher today, Kim, the Reverend Dr. Kim Wagner. Um, you can read more about her bio, uh, bio. I'll just give you a few highlights, but her bio is in the bulletin. Uh, Kim is a, profess the pr a professor of preaching and homiletics at that wonderful school to the north of us, Princeton Theological Seminary, who is also ordained as a minister of word and sacrament in the PCOSA via Lutheran, the Lutherans and Methodists. Uh, and her area of expertise in particular is ministry and preaching in response to trauma. And so uh, I've appreciated getting to know Kim and so I hope I can count her not only as a colleague but also a friend. And we're delighted that you uh, are able to be with us and to proclaim the word this morning. Finally, we always end this time with a moment for generous living, and uh, today is also Consecration Sunday, when we take a moment to give thanks for the generosity we have experienced from God, and we exercise our own generosity uh, for the church. So we dedicate our giving commitments for the coming year on this Sunday, 
Uh, and so at the end of the service, you are invited to come forward during the hymn and uh, put your pledge card in the basket that you'll find under the communion table. If you need a pledge card, there are some here, as well as the usher statement in, uh, station in the back. You can get a pledge card from one of the ushers. Please do if you need that. If you've given online, uh, you'll find a blue giving token that you can also use for the regular offering, and you can consecrate your online gift that way. Uh, and so today we will rejoice in God's generosity after worship by coming together for a wonderful and festive lunch. We're going to have some fun because there will be a magician who will do a kind of uh, some, uh, some fun magic am amidst us. And we will also announce the total that we have raised so far for next year's giving. Uh, but also this year, a very special moment when we will unveil the amount of money that we have raised for our capital fundraising. Uh, this year we're asked to walk and chew gum at the same time, as it were, asking con uh, congregation members not only to consider their giving for the ongoing uh, functioning of our congregation, but for filling the gap uh, necessary to complete our construction and, uh, and our, our capital projects. We've been doing a, having a quiet phase of fundraising, uh, and we will announce the result of that uh, at lunch. So please join us. Fellowship Center, you don't have to be a member. You don't have to have given something. It's all free. Please come and join us for lunch after worship. Friends, uh, that is all the news that's fit to print or speak. So let us move from getting here truly to being here as we worship God together. Friends, this is truly the day that the Lord has made, and so let us together rejoice and be glad in it. I'm always reminded as we gather together in the name of uh, Jesus for worship, we are here, certainly, and God is here, and so let us together worship God.
Let us pray. Lord God, we worship and praise you, the only creator and redeemer. You called the universe into being. You called Israel into covenant life. You came in Jesus to a world needing love. And through him, we also worship you as father, as close and caring as a loving parent. Thank you for calling each of us, not only into sacred spaces and relationships, but in everyday life. Thank you for leading us, even by our schemes and weaknesses, by dreams and desires. We remember your call, your steadfast love, and your mercy in the silence. Amen. Friends, I would invite you to join me in standing in body and or spirit as we hear the good news. As Christian people, we proclaim a gospel that holds grace at the center. A gospel message of good news that reminds us that we are not defined by our sins and our shortcomings, but rather in Jesus Christ, we are beloved children of God. And so this morning, I invite you to hear and believe and to trust the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated, and children do come forward for the children's message. I may need a little more volume on this microphone. We've got some. Okay. Come on down. Come on down. How you doing? How you doing, Annie? Hi. Come on down. Plenty of room up front. How's everybody doing? You doing okay today? All right, well, I want to know how many of you have uh, ever had a, a trip where you were on an airplane? How many of you have been on an airplane, a jet? That's probably most of you. How many of you have taken a trip outside? Yes, lots of times you've been on a, on a plane. And, and how, so that means that probably most all of you have been on a trip outside Lawrence Township. So let me ask you this. What do you need when you go traveling somewhere? What? Yeah, Penny. A suitcase, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking about. You need to bring stuff with you. You need a suitcase in order to put stuff, in. like what would you put in your suitcase, maybe? Yes. Your toothbrush. Your toothbrush. And your pajamas, that's uh, the essentials, yeah. Right, right. So you know, sometimes people take a lot of stuff. I'm kind of, I, I remember this too because I was traveling to uh, Europe this, uh, past week and a half, and uh, I tried to bring as little as I could, but I still brought a lot of stuff. Sometimes people bring these huge suitcases with them on the plane, or they have to check them, and they have lots of baggage. But can you imagine taking nothing with you at all and going on a trip? No. Yeah. Because that's actually what Jesus asked his disciples to do uh, at one point. So he asked his disciples to go out and travel and speak the message, teach the message that he had been teaching them. And in this case, 72 of his disciples, not just 12, and he said, go two by two and uh, go out there and teach my message, proclaim my message to people and, and heal people 
and that kind of thing. And they took nothing with them, not anything. They didn't take an extra set of clothes. They didn't even take a wallet with them. They didn't take any money. Can you imagine? Well, they, they had what they call purse. They had a purse, like a, a pocket, where they would keep money. So, yeah, I mean, any idea why? He might have said, don't take anything. But let me ask this question then. How do you... They got stuff from that, but they didn't have any money, is the thing. Yeah, Tommy. Well, uh, God, God protected them because of their faith. Yes. Yeah, I right. would never be able to go on that journey. I don't think I would either. I wouldn't be able to do that. But you know what? That's, a, that's exactly right. They had to trust in God, and also they had to trust that people would help them, right? Yes. What do you think? No, they didn't go naked. No, they, they, they didn't go naked. They only had the clothes on their back, and that's it. And that's it. But, but you know what, Jesus, that would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, you didn't know. I know. You might, might have thought that. Um, but Jesus said, go into a house uh, where there might be friendly people, and they will provide for your needs. And so that's what people did. They, they were very happy to accept them into their home because they were giving a message of hope and they were healing people. Back then they would heal people by laying hands on and they healed people through the spirit of Jesus back, back then too. And so they would accept the hospitality of people as they went around. And uh, you know what is interesting is to do that we have to depend on and trust that our needs will be provided by people along the way. And that's what they experienced. Because Tommy, yes, they trusted God, that God would provide for their needs through the hospitality of people. And sometimes I think that's a way we experience God's generosity to us, that God will provide what we need on this journey through life. All right, boys and girls, that's what we're going to be talking about in worship, and maybe you want to talk about it uh, today around your dinner table with your, with your family. Um, I think that would be a great idea. Thanks for hanging out with me, and let's stand and give and receive our usual blessing. The adults say, may the Lord be with you there, and the children say, we'll see you later. This morning's uh, scripture reading comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, uh, beginning in verse 1. Listen now for the word of the Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house 
Eating and drinking, whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, Go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we will wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me. And whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 72 returned to Jesus with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Indeed, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this. That the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. I bring greetings from uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, and it is such a joy and a privilege to be with you all today. Thanks to Jeff and Kyle and all of you for inviting me to come and worship with you. So besides being a uh, professor and a teacher and a preacher, one of my greatest joys in life is getting to be an auntie, both to my biological niece niece and an honorary aunt to many of my dear friend's children. I was visiting one of my honorary nieces, Maria, not too long ago. At about three years old, Maria is spunky, smart, curious, and like many kids her age, full of big opinions and even bigger feelings. I have learned over my visits that I need to warn her when I am leaving so she can anticipate and process my departure. Now, I'd been visiting her family uh, for about a week, and as we were playing camping on the floor of her room one afternoon, I gently broached the subject. Hey, Maria, I'm, I'm having so much fun with you, but I just wanted to remind you that I will be leaving tomorrow to go back to my house. I waited for her response, bracing myself for whatever emotions might come my way. And so she stopped playing with the pretend campfire set I had brought her and looked up, confused. What's a tomorrow, she asked. Well, I said, after we sleep tonight and wake up, it will be tomorrow. Okay, she responded, unconvinced. But how long until tomorrow? I said, well, it's about 4 o'clock now, so in about 14 hours, we'll wake up and it'll be tomorrow. What's an hour? (laughs) She asked. Deciding to embrace this as a learning moment, I pulled down her wall clock in her room and tried to explain the concept and measurement of time to, yes, a three-year-old. She interrupted me before I could get too far. Aunt Kim she said, pleading with me. Why don't you just show me where on the clock tomorrow is? And with that, I knew we were lost. (laughs) You know what I suggested? Let's just play and enjoy our time together now. Great, she squealed, picking up her play sleeping bag. And then we can pretend it's tomorrow. Friends, the concept of tomorrow is one of those things that we somehow grow to understand, but as I discovered with Maria, find hard to explain. I often feel the same way when I'm asked what exactly we people of faith mean when we talk about grace. Not the prayer at the kitchen table grace, 
but the theological concept of grace. And I know this is something you all have been exploring together through your Reformation sermon series. Still, I think grace can be a hard concept to grasp. Don't get me wrong, I know the scriptures, like Ephesians 2, by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not works that anyone should boast. Or, for, or 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you. Or John 1, out of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. And as a good seminary professor and Presbyterian minister, I can recite a basic working definition of grace as undeserved or unearned love or favor. And many of us may have heard or used phrases like, but for the grace of God go I. But even with all these texts and definitions and sayings firmly in place, grace can often feel like a nebulous, slippery concept, almost as esoteric as the idea of tomorrow. It is this term that we, we think we know what it means, but it's a little hard to pin down. We know we rely on grace, that we need grace, that God gifts us grace, but sometimes the concept of grace feels so big, so mysterious, so abstract that it is hard for us to fully grasp or describe. That is why I'm so grateful for our reading today from the Gospel of Luke. In this text, Luke seems to put grace on the ground. Jesus isn't giving some advanced theological lecture or dictating a dogmatic thesis on grace as a concept. Instead, Jesus is simply giving his followers clear instructions as he sends them out. And if they follow these instructions, Jesus insists that they will find grace on the way. You see, at this point in the arc of the gospel story, Jesus has been traveling around Galilee, teaching, healing, and proclaiming the welcome and love of God. The closest disciples, those 12, have just returned from a mission of their own and have encountered the glory of Christ in the transfiguration. But now, Jesus' larger group of followers, not just the closest 12, are being sent into the mission field. They are instructed to go out, two by two, ahead of Jesus, to prepare the way, to prep the soil, if you will, for Jesus' message and ministry. After all, Jesus admits that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There are so many people who are hungry for the good news, and Jesus needs all the help he can get. So see, Jesus sends these 72 out with some pretty specific and sometimes odd instructions. Because you see, the mission for these 72 is not in the public square. Not being, they're not being sent to the synagogues or city hall steps or to marketplaces. These missionaries are being sent to households. They are to prepare the way for Jesus's anticipated ministry through building community and cultivating relationship. And they are to do three things once they get to this households. First, they are to extend peace. Second, they are to cure the sick or perhaps better translated, serve those who are hurting. And third, proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Simple enough. But this is no motivational speech or pep rally. Jesus warns these willing followers that they are going into possibly unwelcome or even dangerous territory. He warns them that they may find themselves as lambs among wolves, as defenseless creatures being sent to those who may prey on them, those who may just try to eat them alive. And Jesus cautions that not everybody will be welcoming or happy to receive or welcome their message. There may be homes and towns that reject them, and instead of convincing them, the missionaries are instructed to shake the dust off their sandals and move on. So under such dire and 
dangerous circumstances. This makes Jesus' suggested packing list that Jeff talked about with the children that much more odd and surprising. The disciples are instructed to carry no purse, no bag, and no sandals. So therefore, no extra food, no extra provisions, no toothbrush, no toothpaste, pajamas. no pajamas, <laughs> though they are clothed. And they are told not to buy things on the way, not to stop folks on the road. They are pretty much sent with the clothes on their back, and they have to trust that what they need will appear. As a consummate overpacker, raised by an overpacker, this packing list from Jesus, or perhaps better, anti-packing list, makes me really nervous. This past July, my entire family took a much anticipated trip to Hawaii. I remember a few weeks before, getting, before we left, getting an email from my mom, the expert overpacker, with an attached suggested Hawaii pack list that she had found online. But it wasn't just this list from online. She had taken her pen and added probably 10, 20 items to this list. It was clear that she intended that all of us, me, my sister, my dad, my mom, be fully self-sufficient and packed ready for anything. So to say the least, the disciples' anti-packing list from Jesus makes me deeply unsettled. In such a vulnerable situation where they are being sent out to communities they have never visited, to people they don't know, as lambs among wolves, it seems that Jesus is just trying to make them more vulnerable. Why would Jesus command them to not even pack the basic essentials they need to be self-sufficient, much less survive this perilous mission? Well, I wonder if Jesus knew something we and the disciples didn't. That all those things, that packing for self-sufficiency, might get in the way of their capacity to recognize and receive grace. After all, they are instructed to enter the house, offer peace, and then if the hosts are willing, accept a bed, food, drink, hospitality. They are not only to spread the good news of grace, but they are instructed to receive grace. And grace here is not some grandiose, otherworldly idea. Grace in this text is found in meals and welcome, in hospitality and conversation around the table. Grace is found in shared food and pouring drink, existing day to day with one another. In this passage, grace is not some esoteric, hard to grasp concept. Grace is embodied in relationship, in food cooked, in dishes shared, in hospitality, in care and conversation and welcome. The disciples are told to bring the grace of God through healing and proclamation, but they are also instructed to receive grace, to open themselves to the grace offered by strangers they encounter along the way. Friends, today Jesus reminds us in the Gospel of Luke that grace is not some amorphous theological concept. Grace is not some fancy idea that lives just out of our reach. Grace is that which we extend to one another when we are willing not only to give, but to receive. Grace is found in those small, everyday things that are all around us acts of hospitality and generosity embodied in friends and strangers. I mentioned earlier my mom's gift for packing, or overpacking. Unfortunately, I lost my mom to a very fast-moving cancer about a month ago. When we returned from our overpacked trip to Hawaii, 
My mom got sick and was diagnosed with lymphoma and died less than two months later after six weeks in the ICU in Charleston, South Carolina. To say it has been a challenging season is an understatement. And as too many of us know, when we lose a precious loved one, particularly quickly or prematurely or unexpectedly, grace can be hard to find. When we find ourselves knocked off our expected courses, whether through the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or the loss of a dream or the loss of a relationship or even just the overwhelming anxieties and realities of life and this world, sometimes grace can feel far away. In some ways, it can feel like grief or anxiety or pain can form a sort of shield that makes that powerful force called grace hard to access. And yet, and yet, in spite of the ways grief and loss try to whisper in our ears that we should despair and that God is far away, I can point to literally hundreds of moments of embodied grace that have shown up during this journey through my mother's illness and death. There are those ICU nurses who brought fresh pillows and blankets, not just for mom, but for us, as we took turns sitting by her bedside 14 hours a day in the freezing cold hospital room. There was that dinner left on my doorstep in a cooler by a colleague when I arrived home from my mother's funeral, all ready for me to eat so I didn't have to worry about making anything. There were the Princeton Seminary students who showed up to our 8.30 a.m. class with an extra large cup of coffee for me, knowing I had flown in super late the night before after being in the ICU with my mom all weekend in Charleston. There was the gift bag hanging on my doorknob from a dear friend and favorite travel buddy with a sympathy card, a bottle of bourbon labeled for now, <laughs> and a travel book about going to Iceland in 2024 labeled for later. There was the couple that took over a pot of chili to my dad's house the day my sister and I had to leave and he was left all alone in the house for the first time. And they not only fed him, but they ate with him in hopes it would make the house feel a little less empty. And there were the neighbors, my parents' neighbors, who came over with fresh vegetables from their garden, really just a cover for wanting to come over, sit, listen, and check in. I could go on and on. Let's be clear, none of these were large, flashy acts. None of these felt that big to the giver or that big a deal in the face of the loss. And yet each one of these acts, separately and taken together, became a powerful embodiment of God's grace for me and my family over these past months. Each pot of chili or hug or taco or tear shared or loaf of bread baked became so much more. They became the grace of God to and for us. And friends, that's the thing about grace. In the presence of Christ, seemingly small acts of embodied care are transformed into cosmic acts of grace of the kingdom. After all, when the 72 returned from their mission, they returned with joy and excitement. They couldn't believe what they had encountered and what they were able to do when they tuned in and leaned on God's grace. Lord, in your name, even the demons submitted to us, they exclaimed. Even our tiny acts, Lord, had big results. And Jesus shares in their excitement, responding, Yes, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Because as it turns out, those 
little conversations around the table, those acts of care, those meals shared, the proclamation of the missionaries, those small in scale, those small in scale had cosmic results. Because Jesus reminds us, these seemingly small acts of grace participate in the larger work of the kingdom of God. Friends, these acts of proclamation and care and hospitality are the building blocks of the kingdom. And when assembled in the presence of Christ, they become so much more. Today, here at the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville, we are celebrating Consecration Sunday, where we as individuals and as community are invited to offer gifts of time, talent, and treasure generously for the work of the church. In one way, these pledges and offerings can feel small or even insignificant in the face of the needs of the church and the needs of the world. And yet when given, these gifts can be embodied expressions of grace. Grace that in the presence of Christ participates in the larger work of the kingdom that we can't even begin to see or imagine. Friends, even our modest gifts, our small expressions of grace and generosity can be transformed into powerful acts of peacemaking and justice building in the presence of Christ. Grace is not just some force that comes at us. Friends, grace is embodied in the everyday things we do. Grace is experienced, it is given, and it is received along the way. May we be open to the everyday tastes of grace around us as we give and receive, trusting that like the missionaries proclaimed, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Amen.
standing as we can affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, help us not to lay up treasure here on earth, but to know heaven as a treasure right here and right now. God, help us discover and know the treasured lifestyle you have provided for us as Christians, a life of hope and peace and community and love. Help us truly to know and appreciate the gift of this community. Help us, God, discover that. Help us to live that. Help us to experience that. The miracle of your grace, which we experience through our giving, through the time we spent helping people, mentoring a person moving from prison life to stable life, shoveling the neighbor's driveway, putting some boxes of pasta into the food pantry. And God, help us to experience that generosity when we receive help we didn't know we even needed. A friend who makes us dinner when we don't have time. Someone's embrace amidst a moment of sorrow. A wise counselor who prevents you from making a terrible mistake. A spouse's loving and undeserved embrace. Lord, help us to take in that ultimate gift, which is Jesus, the life of Jesus given for us that we might live this kind of generous life. God, you set before us a banquet, your grace, your life, and so help us to enjoy, to find joy, and to live a life of joyful service. This morning, we also remember people who need your particular care, and we remember the brokenness of this world in which we live. And so for people known to us and unknown to us who need your grace and care, For the wounded world, we lift up our prayers in the silence. God, help us to know grace. Help us to live a life in thanksgiving and gratitude for all that you have bestowed upon us, all that you have done for us. And teach us to pray that our lives and not just our words might be prayers. We pray that as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we do not give out of obligation. We give out of gratitude and thanksgiving as a response to what we have known and experienced in Jesus Christ. And so we enact that every Sunday in this simple act, this simple act of giving, 
uh, as the ushers come forward and we offer a token of our gratitude by giving of our gifts and our offerings.
you for all that you have done for us and with us. We dedicate this offering in gratitude to you and your blessings, and we ask that it might enable us to point to your kingdom, to exhibit your kingdom to all the earth, that we might together show the love and justice of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. the benediction a reminder that you are all invited to lunch um, and I was told to do that so you all are invited to lunch so please please join us friends I pray that you may see the grace of God at work in your hands and in others hands in your conversations that you share with each other in the presence of friends and in the presence of strangers May you experience God's embodied grace that is transformed for the work of the kingdom. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>